marketing for four and a half years now. Um, I used to work at Starbucks before, and the reason I got into trading is because uh, my girlfriend dumped me and I want to get rich. It's like pretty simple like that. Uh, not really. She was, she was, I don't know. Yeah, she was, I don't know. Because she was hot. I don't know. It's, it's, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about her. So anyway, I was, uh, I saw all like the things online, like the, yeah. I saw, that'd be nice. That'd be nice. So again, I've always been into like the whole Wall Street movies, all like these guys in the nice suits and the nice cars and all that stuff. And I said like, you know, I, I don't think I'm a dumb kid. I don't think I'm like, I think I could do it for myself as well. So again, I dived into it. I found like some of these online gurus that everyone else kind of gets into and kind of falls into their trap. And long story short, I lost money my first year, kind of going long the breakout. You know, buy it, I always used to buy at the highs. I always used to sell at the lows. And I started to recognize that if I didn't kind of change what I was doing, you know, that was it for me. You know, I wasn't making that much money at Starbucks. I was making like a hundred bucks a week. And if I put $60 to gas and the rest of my girlfriend, like I didn't really have much money. So it kind of took me to break up with her to kind of start to accumulate some money. And then I really started to kind of find success when I uh, sold my wheels on my car for two grand and funded like another account because I was just like, Fuck it. like I need to do this. Like I want to be, I want to do this. Like, I see myself making money on some of the trades, but I'm losing also because I have no discipline. I have no plan. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just kind of winging it. I'm not going in with a plan. I'm not going in with a strategy. I'm just doing whatever I think is right. And that's wrong. You got to kind of make a plan before everything and know how to attack. You got to know your technicals. You got to know your fundamentals. You got to know all this shit. So long story short, uh, after my first year, I was losing money. And then I started to kind of find out what shorting was. Someone mentioned that you could make money when stocks go down. And I was like, I'm good at that. You know, every time I buy a stock, it goes down anyway. You know, let me just do the opposite. And, you know, that's it. So on my first trade, I shorted 2,000 shares of a stock called uh, VGGL. And it dropped 50 cents instantly. And I made $1,000. And I was like, holy shit. Like, I got it. This is the holy grail. I found it. Like, boom. So over the years, I was kind of, kind of like trying to refine that strategy and kind of see like why the stock went down. You know, was it technicals? Was it fundamentals? What was the reason for it? And I started getting a little bit better, but then I started to realize I had no risk management. I was not stopping outright. I was just doing whatever I thought I was doing again. Like I was just kind of winging it again. I wasn't making a plan again, but you know, I started to find profits going short. So that's where the whole thing of kind of making a plan came into, came into place, where before I entered a trade, before I did anything, I would have to make a plan for it. If my plan was there was a daily resistance at $5 on the chart, I would short near that number, and if the next resistance or whatever it was, I would make sure to have a stop out point. So I guess over the years, I've, again, refined that strategy and kind of gotten better at reading tape, technicals, fundamentals, and all that stuff. And I started to realize that the tape tells the story. It's almost everything is about the tape. So I've sat there for hours and hours just watching the tape till like my eyes literally bleed. Or even today, like I didn't want to trade today, but I was watching AXO went and it was like a movie. I cracked open a beer and I was sitting there watching the tape, just mindlessly just watching to see what I could find. And like I said, now four, four and a half years in, I'm starting to find real solid, large profits almost consistently. I've been, I think my longest, my biggest month was in January, which was around 650 grand. And my longest win streak was about 33 days this past month, which was around 300 grand. And again, I kind of mentioned, I talk a lot on Twitter about like kind of my journey to kind of see if people could relate to it or if I could kind of help people. I always respond to everyone that messages me. I always respond to everyone to see kind of like a way to pay it forward, right? So I had a loss on Twitter yesterday, which was like $1,000. And I kind of went back and I said, you know, if I made 300 grand in 30 days and I only lost $1,900 on Twitter, that's the definition of risk management. I'm not losing all my money that I made. I'm making a plan and I'm making sure that Again, I stick to do it, and I'm doing everything right. So I guess that's just like a little bit about me. So, so if anyone one, has any. Yeah, so one of the things that, that's interesting in, in reading about you and listening to your podcast is that uh, it, it seems as if, you know, for example, when everybody was trading dry ships, you were looking at the in sympathy plays and that yes. your strategy has sort of evolved into not necessarily trading the low floats or, or, or the stocks that are most in play, but sort of the secondary stocks? Yeah. Uh, is that an accurate description? Yeah, because... Trade and, and how did 
how did that? It basically stemmed from the fact that I couldn't get the borrow on dries. So if I said I can't get the borrow and these other shippers like ESEA or TOPS or DCIX are all moving and the borrow is cheap and I could get it, once you cut off the head of the snake, which was dries, all these other ones fell like that. So that's kind of where I started to realize, that was kind of like the game changing moment that I started to realize that you know, there is a lot of money to be made on the stocks that people aren't really watching as well. Like how many times you trade a stock only to see it three or four days later, do exactly what you wanted because everyone forgot about it. Or you shorted a stock at five and you got stopped out at 550, but a week later it's down at $4. It's just when people forget about stocks, when the kind of volume starts to fade away, these things really just unwind, at least in the small cap world. So again, when dries collapsed that day, I think it was November 12th I don't, or November 8th, whatever it was, I remember saying to myself, because it was halted before, so it was halted around like $100 and then they unhalted because they had an offering. And all these other shipper stocks, like these SINOs that went from a dollar to $14 in literally three days, you know, that stuff is not gonna sustain itself. It's not gonna hold forever. So again, once the head of the snake dries got cut off, I went in full as much as I could, balls deep, short, and all these things, and I had one of the best days in my trading career. So again, it goes to the fact that making a plan, knowing what you're doing, knowing which stocks to attack, which stocks to avoid, or even we were talking about today, AXON, I, start, I saw that you know the shares outstanding is 100 million shares, but their float is 30 million shares. If they're trading 30 million shares in 30 minutes into the day, the stock is up 100%, and it's almost easy to borrow everywhere. You better believe that you know, that shit's gonna keep going higher. And then I think there was a midday downgrade that kind of trapped a bunch of people. And then you see the last 30 minutes in the close, it goes straight up on air. So again, recognizing that that's probably gonna hit $5 or 5.50 in the morning and starting to realize that seeing these patterns happen over and over and over and over again, that's when you start to really like capitalize on them. So the, so the fact that uh, AXON was easy to borrow um, that is a big indicator for whether or not you can something go up or not. It's also about knowing what the sentiment in the market is lately. I feel like everyone on the internet is now getting into being short seller. Everyone wants to short everything. So most of their brokers are not allowing borrows on some of these low float stocks. So they start to realize, oh shit, if this guy's making 10 grand shorting, if this guy's making five grand shorting, and today there's a stock that I could finally get a locate on that's up 100%, that's in a sexy $3 price range, then they're gonna be like, hey, you know, they're getting FOMO, they're gonna want to attack it. And that's what happens today. Everyone got FOMO, everyone wanted to attack it. You know, you get that morning push, comes down, and then I think it was 10 minutes into the day, it had a candle from 350 to 380, and then as soon as you see that shit, you know that's gonna go kind of straight up. But again, they kind of trap all day, they were consolidating around the pre-market highs and stuff. It's just recognizing all these patterns over and over and over again, seeing that it's easy to borrow, seeing that people are in a market that they want to short and they're getting FOMO, they're getting antsy and just recognizing all that stuff. Like, if I was home right now and I was on my platform, I would probably be long overnight because I know that shorts had no chance to get out. And being a short seller myself, I start to recognize when people are trapped. I start to recognize because it's happened to me so many times that I'm starting to finally see that, you know, there's money to be made going long on some of these plays as well. Yeah, I, I saw a tweet that you wrote uh, recently where you said you want to start working on your long game. Yes. I know there's a lot of guys who are really strong short sellers in the room who are working on that as well. Yeah. Um, anything specifically you're doing to think about how you can get better at your long game for some of these opportunities? I'm just testing it out and diving right in because the way that I see it is that, like I had a tweet the other day, let me see if I could read it. It'll kind of explain everything better, but. Um, You can't read about doing push-ups. You don't go to basketball school. You play basketball to get better at basketball. This applies to trading stocks as well. No matter how many books you read or videos you watch, you will not succeed until you dive in. So I don't see myself getting better at longs until I start testing them out and going in and doing it myself. So again, yeah, I'm gonna lose money because I'm still trying to get better at it, but you know, I'd rather be losing $500 a day or $1,000 a day for that opportunity to make $10,000 a day consistently after I refine my strategy. So again, it's all about risk management. It's about you know, taking smaller size on the long side. So let's say my starter position on short is 10,000 shares. I'm gonna be taking 500 or 1,000 shares on that long trade just to get better at it, just to practice it, just to dip my feet in and you know, see what I could learn from that. Because 
you know, when you have stocks like Drys, as much shitty stocks they are, they went from $6 to $100. There's stocks like, uh, was it CVSI, was that one? That went from 50 cents to $2.50 or whatever it was. Like, there's money to be made on these long trades, or even Tesla today. Like, you gotta be shitting me. Like, if you're not both a long and short bias trader, like, you're missing out on a lot of money that's out there. And I don't wanna miss out on anything. I want a piece of all of it. So the only way I'm gonna get a piece of all of it is if I start to learn how to do all of it. And that's why I've been trying to dip my feet into options as well. That's why I've been trying to dip my feet into everything. And the best teacher that I see is literally doing it yourself and learning from your own mistakes. Because no matter how many book, books you read about risk management, no matter how many videos you watch on the internet or YouTube or whatever it is, until you're sitting there with the chart and the level two and all the buying power in your face, you don't really know what kind of way you're gonna react in that situation. So another thing that, that I think I pick up from uh, your tweets is that it's really important for you to be green on the day. Yeah. Why is that? Well, it's not about being green on the day. It's about making sure I follow my plan. So if I'm green on the day, there's been plenty of times that I have not followed my plan and been green on the day. And those are the days that piss me off the most because I don't want to be making a $5,000 because I was stubborn or greedy or egotistical. I want to be making that money because I followed my plan and I did exactly what I was supposed to do. If I'm following my plan and I lose, that's a winner to me because I know that in the long run, nine times out of 10, that play is always going to pay me. There's always going to be that one time that you know, I kind of lose on it. So it's all about trusting your process. It's about, again, I know I keep referencing Twitter all the time, but there's so many like golden nuggets on there. Like, for example, some guy said, um, give me a sec if I could find it. He was basically saying like, how many times have you been in a trade only to kind of freeze up because of it or not really know how to attack or not really know what you're doing? And let me see. It's just, give me a sec, sorry. If you find yourself mentally freezing up before every trade, understand that this is totally normal and every trader has experienced it. However, this is also a subconscious sign that you don't trust your process. You must be all in on your approach. So if you're hesitating and if you're kind of panicking or if you're kind of not doing what you're supposed to do, it means that you still don't trust your process. You still don't trust what you're doing. Like everything that I preach on like the internet is about trusting your process, knowing like to make your plan, knowing what to do making sure that there's something solid there, something concrete that you can kind of go back on and just consistently, again, make money. It's not about making 10 grand in a month. It's not about making 100 grand a month. It's about making that money every single day. It's about coming to the market and being able to pull money out of it every single day rather than having that one giant winner because anyone, I think, can make money in the markets. I think it's really easy to make money in the market. It's just there's not many people that are able to keep that money. A lot of people start to get egotistical and start to lose that sh almost instantly. So it's just a matter of kind of remaining humble and realizing that, you know, sh could always change. There's always that one trade that could kind of change you. So it's just stick to your plan, stick to your strategy, and just don't waver no matter what. Okay. And can you describe to us your review plan at the end of the day? How do you review your trading at the end of the day? Yeah, so let me kind of walk you through like my normal day. Okay, perfect. So I'm always awake really early. I guess I have like some sort of sleeping problem. I'm up at like 5 a.m. every single day. And, you know, I take a shower, brush my teeth, I eat breakfast. And then I get right to the computer and I say, okay, which stocks are, since I'm short, so I look for the stocks that are gapping up the most to whatever. I look at which stocks are gapping up the most. I check the high the day list. I check my top list. I check the scanners. I do whatever I have to do to see which stocks are up. So I see, okay, XYZ stock is up 100% pre-market because of some contract that they got. So I say, okay, first things first is on these small cap companies, a lot of them are shady and they released the same news six months ago. So I see, okay, did they release this news before time or did they release it another time? And what happened the last time they released that news? If it was that the stock went from $2 to $6 and then closed at $3, I, and I know that you know the daily chart says that it kind of has that one wick where it kind of gives back all the time. I know that that's a type of stock that I'm interested in shorting on day one. But if it's kind of a stock that the daily is really beaten up and there's not really too much going on or like a 52 week breakout, I don't short those at all because I don't see an edge in shorting a 52 week breakout. I don't see an edge in any of that stuff. So I look for my edge and then I check what the float is. If it's low float, high float, institutionally owned, 
I check the filings if there's any ATMs, S3s, check their cash situation if last time they raised, last time, uh, last time uh, anything else that's happened. And then from there, I look at the chart. I always base my trades based on the daily chart. I see where are the resistance spots on the daily. I see what were the levels that gave this stock the most trouble last time. And I make a plan. I say, okay, $5 was the top end of this week. My short is gonna be based off $5 with a stop on 525 or whatever it's gonna be. Make my plan. Hopefully I get in right at the open, spikes up like I said. Make sure I have my borrows and then I attack from there and then close out my position. And then at the end of the day, usually is when I take a photo of my chart with the entries and exits. I print them out and I kind of go back and review it at the weekend to see which charts are moving, how I played it, and how I could kind of improve on playing it next time. So again, everyone has their own process that they kind of focus on. Everyone does their own thing. But if you're not kind of journaling your trades, if you're not kind of watching how your trades are going, if you're not kind of critiquing yourself, how, are you, how would you ever expect to improve? It's just a matter of, again, refining your strategy and keep on trying to improving it. Making sure that, again, like I said, I make sure I print out all my charts with the entries and exits or take a screenshot or whatever it is. Like, yeah, it's cool to make five grand on a chart, but was I following my plan is what's most important because I can make five grand a thousand times, but that one time I could lose all of it and more. So risk management, everything. It's just a matter of seeing what works for you. Like I know a lot of traders that are making a ton of money going long and a lot of traders that are making a lot of money going short, but it all comes down to the fact that they have a plan and they're ready to kind of execute on that plan. They have their certain setups that are a plus setups that, you know, no matter what, whenever they see that, shit, they're going to go all in. And as far as when um, you have, uh, when you know, this is, you spoke about your winning streak before, yeah. right? And your current winning streak. Yeah. How do you scale yourself up as far as risk wise? Size? That's a great question. Well, it takes time. I mean, like, I wasn't always trading size either. Before there was scenarios where. Like I said, my first trade on VGGL was 2,000 shares short. Now, if I'm in 2,000 shares, it's because I've partially filled my 10,000 share order, right? So a lot of things have changed. It's all a matter of building confidence first, being able to see that those setups that you've been playing small size on are working, and then slowly when you see those setups happen again, to then like raise your size up. If I'm shorting 50,000 shares on a stock, if I'm trying to go, learn how to go long, I'm not going to go long more than 5,000 shares because I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know, like, I'm still learning that whole process as well. So once you kind of find a strategy that works for you, once you see that it's been <clears throat> bringing you profits consistently, then you have the permission to scale up. Because again, sizing is uh, sizing's not easy. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. There's slippage, there's emotions, there's, if you're losing, you know, $1,000 on every tick that the stock is moving, every penny that the stock is moving, there's gonna be heightened emotions. There's gonna be some people that literally can't handle that. Some people that are gonna freeze when the stock goes against them. So it's not like an overnight process. It's not an easy process, but again, it takes time. It takes to refine your strategy, to be comfortable with it, to make sure that you've done it plenty of times to see it work over and over again to again, give yourself the permission to kind of scale that up. Your, your last blog post, you went back and looked at yeah. your results from like four years ago? Yeah, it was from... What, what do they look like? Let's see. Because it was actually funny because I don't know why I took all those pictures of my P&Ls from back then. I guess I was just kind of excited that I was making money, like finally. I said, F let me take some pictures of it. But So there's been plenty of times that I've been posting on Twitter that I've made like 10,000, 20,000, 30, 40, 50, 100,000 in a day, but people are like, oh, shit, this guy can make that much, but they don't realize that going back to my chart, like my other plays, I have one from, let's see, December 15th, 2014, I made $333 on American Airlines. December 29th, I made $80 on GoPro. March 4th, I made $450 on NVGN. March 5th, ZIOP, $156. Now fast forward to the end of it, you see 104,000 on the days the shipper crashed, 67,000 on drives, 15,000 on MOTS, 12,000 on here, 13,000 on Spotify, 
6,000 on blank, 61,000 on UVXY. Like, it takes years and a lot of sacrifice, blood, sweat, and tears, and a lot of emotions to start to realize that it's all fun and games when you're trading 500 shares, but when you're getting in there and trading 50,000 shares or 100,000 shares or 200,000 shares of dries or whatever it is, everything changes. Like you have those sleepless nights, you have those times that you don't wanna leave the house when you have a bad day. You have those times where you kind of pick a fight with anyone in your family just to release that anger. And most people wanna make that, that stupid money, but they don't realize that it really affects your life in a negative way as well if you're not really prepared for it. So sizing isn't a matter of just doing it just to do it. You have to earn the right to size up. And you have to start to realize that, you know, once you size up, there's no going back. There's never a time that I'm ever going to go back trading a thousand shares because, one, it's not exciting. Two, I feel like I'm losing if I'm making a hundred dollars. And three, it's just not fun anymore. It's not fun. Like I love, like, I love trading size, but again, it's not easy. It's not. You shouldn't ever be comparing yourself to someone that's been trading size. Like a good friend of mine, Eric Wood, has been trading for 10, 20 years, and. His starter position is 50,000 shares. There's been plenty of times he's been short, you know, 300, 400, 500,000 shares. He made $3 million when dries collapsed because he was holding 500,000 shares for a month. And you start to realize that I'm not Eric Wood. You know, he's bald. Like, he lost all of his hair because he's so stressed out. Like, he smokes all the time. He drinks all the time. Like, like that's not the life I want, man. Like, I don't want that shit. But again, people are intoxicated by those big profits, so they try to dive into it before they're really ready. And that's the one thing that I always suggest against. Like, don't do it until you're ready for it. Don't do it until your strategy is working for you. Because like I said, you're not going back after that. It's not going back. Like you won't, no matter what, you're not going back to trading small size. So take your time. Like, again, I'm four and a half years in and I can't wait to be trading the size that I see some of my friends trade. But again, you know, I don't have a $10 million account. I don't have all the stupid money to play with that, you know, these other people have. I don't, that's just not me. But again, you know, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. Like we go, we party all the time, all, every weekend. We have a great time. I'm 23 years old. Like why am I gonna lose my hair? Like, it's just a matter of knowing what type of, what type of person you are and knowing that, you know, I'm not Eric. I'm not X, I'm not Y, I'm not Z, I'm myself and you know, my journey is different than anyone else's, so you can't be comparing yourself to anyone else. So how do you deal with, as far as when you're having um, a basketball or a little bit of a losing streak, or not doing performing well, up to your standards? Well, what I like to do, what I used to do is, I used to just trade, at, like let's say I had a giant loss, I would say, okay, I'm always right market. Like you can't squeeze me, you can't beat me, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna take my money. And that was the wrong mentality. I learned a lot of times that if you do that, the market is always right. She's always right. So what I've kind of learned is that it's okay to take a day or two away from the screens. Like go to like, go hang out with your friends. Like go and start to realize that life isn't always about, you know, the hundred thousand share seller on Tesla at three hundred dollars or whatever it is. It's not always about that stuff. So kind of going back and hanging out with my friends or kind of going back to reality and kind of recognizing that I need to clear my thoughts, I gotta clear my emotions, I'm too emotional right now to trade. Like, for example, if your girlfriend cheated on you or if you're having problems at home or if something's going wrong, you shouldn't be trading because you're not emotionally stable. You have to be emotionally sharp, you have to be emotionally stable to make a dollar in this business because if my girlfriend cheated on me or if someone did something on me, you better believe like I'm gonna take my anger out on the market, I'm gonna size up to try to make more money. It's just, it's, I feel like it's just human nature but the moment I start to step back and realize that like, let me just take a day off, man. Let me go buy something to make myself feel it. Let me just do anything to get away from the market for at least one day to kind of clear my thoughts and come back the next day a lot stronger. So that's been helping me. Just kind of getting away from the market, clearing my thoughts and realizing that you're probably gonna be emotional after a massive loss. So take yourself out of that equation. Don't come back to trade the next day. At least sit there and watch or do something else to kind of just clear yourself because if you don't have a clear head, there's no shot you have any edge in the market. What's up? So I, <clears throat> I listened to an interview with you and you said that you had previously, before you found success, found a lot of 
not so much success. It took you a while to learn the ropes. Yeah. And you blew up a few smaller trading accounts. Of course, yeah. Has not everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's only normal. So what changed from you doing that to finding success in only a matter of probably, what, two years before you really found success? Yeah, well. And was it more psychological or was it more like fundamentally process-based? I started to get better. So something that really helped me is that I was kind of always going in there winging it. I would wake up at 9 a.m. and I'd see a stock that's up 100% and I'd say, all right, you know, whatever. I'm just going to short it here and do whatever I want. Now I finally have like a plan in mind. I wake up and I don't care who you are. I don't care what you do. If you're not sitting there throughout pre-market and just watching everything, watching every single tick, no matter what, sitting there from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., staring at the screen and trying to pick up the little nuances that most people are missing, you're at already at a disadvantage. So I started to commit myself to my craft. I said, I want this to work. I want to be the next whoever it is. I want to kind of prove everyone wrong. I want to say screw you to my girlfriend or whatever it is. And I hate her so much. I hate her so much. I hate her so much. Yeah. So yeah, I guess whatever. If that's what it caused for me to get to where I am now, I'm thankful. So, yeah, I was making a plan now. That's all it came down to. I was making a plan. I was going into the market every single day and saying, these are my entries. This is my resistance spot. This is what I see on the filings. This is what it is. And then once I see that 50,000 share hidden seller on the tape showing 100 shares on the ask, and he's filling, 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 and he's not budging, I'm going to smoke the bids myself. I don't give a shit. I'll do it myself. Like, who, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Once I see that sign that it's kind of reconfirming my plan, I'm gonna take action. I'm gonna take action because I trust my process so well. I trust it so much that I know that nine times out of 10, technicals are everything. The chart always follows the technicals, always. You always look back and you'll always see, like AXON has a gap fill at 550 or 560 or whatever it is. It's probably gonna hit that tomorrow and then that's gonna be my entry for the short. So I'm making a plan. I'm always making a plan. If you go in there and just wing it every single morning, if you're not going in there and making sure you're sitting there longer than the next trader, you're at a disadvantage. Screw it. Eat lunch at four, bro. That's it. All right, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So AXON 550 is your level tomorrow and mm -hmm. it goes up there. How are you actually executing? Are you going to scale it? Let's see. Are Let's see what the... Half, half into strength, half on a, on a peak. Like, what are your... You're going to wait for a kill candle to size in. Yeah, so I usually, okay. So I'm kind of, uh, I get FOMO like anyone else, right? I'm not, I'm only human. Like if I see it going there, let's say my plan is to take 50,000 shares short on it tomorrow because it's day two, I feel a little bit more comfortable taking it. If it goes up to that 550 level and I see that, you know, it's starting to exhaust itself, I'll take 10,000 shares. I'll put it on right there and see how it's trading just to kind of get myself a better feel of how the stock is trading. Because you don't really recognize how a stock is trading until you have skin in the game. You start to pay more attention to it. You start to realize that you start to see the little nuances. So I'm going to take a starter position there based on my plan. And then two things are going to happen after that. Either it's going to go to 275 and I'm going to stop out, or it's going to go from, I mean, it's going to go to 575 and I'm going to stop out, or it's going to go from 550, go down to 525, bounce to 540, and then come back down. On that second lower high, is when I'm gonna take another 10,000 shares on it. So I'm gonna have 20,000 shares. And then what I like to use is VWAP all the time. That's my number one indicator. So if it's under VWAP and consolidating under VWAP and start to break down under VWAP on day two after it exhausts itself, then I'm gonna dump in that extra 30,000 shares. And then from there, I'll have 50,000 shares at whatever average, probably at a stop at high of the day at 550 to kind of mitigate my risk. And then if I start to realize that, you know, the news is bullshit, or whatever it's going to be, I either make a plan of covering half based on the chart support levels or holding it overnight and seeing what happens next. But I always like to take profits along the way just to make sure that I'm comfortable being more patient because there's nothing worse than having an unrealized gain turn into uh, an unrealized loss or a realized loss. So I make sure to lock in that profit, just a little bit of it, just so that I know that I have some wiggle room just in case this is going against me. Yeah. What's up? Um, what's your 
I'm pretty sure you remember your, the drives day. You yep. that vividly. What's your, what was your drawdown that day as you're positioning into everything? What was my drawdown? I was so emotional for making so much money that I focused on the money instead of the trade. So I remember, um, I remember it was drives halted and they were announced to unhalt that day. And the one stock was SINO that closed at like $8 and gapped up to $14 that day. So knowing that once the head of the stake drives got cut off, that these sympathy plays would also give up as well, I start to size into all of these sympathy plays. Once tries unhalted at 50, I started selling off at 30. This SINO went from $14 to like $7 that same day. But I was making so much money that day that I didn't, I wasn't patient to hold even longer. I said, I'm up $100,000. I'm gonna take that money, I'm gonna go party. Instead, if I was kind of focused on the chart and not emotional and focusing on the play rather than my mentality, I could have made more because the next day they dropped even more. And then the third day after that, they washed out and then rebounded big. So I was more focused on the money rather than the trade, which I feel like a lot of people struggle with. They see $500, they see $1,000, they say, I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna take that because I've been losing for so long that I need some money or whatever it is, that just forget the money for just a second. Just focus on what the chart is telling you. Focus on what the tape is telling you. If it's saying that these stocks are gonna go lower or they're gonna go higher, Focus on that rather than your P&L. And I know that some people hide their P&L, some people don't like to see it or whatever it is. I'm good at math, so no matter if I hide the P&L or not, I'm gonna know how much money I'm up or down. But if you're, you gotta be focusing on the chart, not the money at this point. You gotta be focusing on your entries. You gotta be focusing on that. And I was not focusing on that. I was focusing on my P&L, and that's what my drawdown was on that day. Wait, what was the drawdown? <laughs> focusing on the money rather than the trade. Because so, more specifically, it's, it's like were you down 50k before you were up 100k? That's what I'm talking about. No, not at all. Not at all. I was up. The moment drives unhalted and start to sell off hard, I slammed everything I could on those trades, and I was up so fast that I didn't recognize anything else rather than just making the money. So it's just a matter of the chart, man. Like recognizing what the chart is telling you, not what your brain is telling you. It's not about making all that money. It's about following what the chart says. So you weren't scaling it on the way up? No. Why should I? They were. It went from a dollar to fourteen dollars in one day, and what if it went to thirty dollars that next day? Or DCX went from seven to twenty-six in one day and closed at like eight dollars or some shit. Like, why do I have to fight on the front side when the back side is so clear to me? When the back side that again when dries on halted at fifty and had that I think it was a private placement offering whatever it was and started to sell off even more. Why were these other sympathy plays even up? They had no reason to be up. They were just gonna sell right off because the, the party was over, the show was over. So once I recognized that, that's when I attacked. Why am I gonna attack ahead of time? Why do I wanna, why do I wanna bleed out? Why do I wanna exhaust myself mentally? Why do I wanna get in early when it was so clear that the backside was in after Dry's collapse that it was so, you could have shorted a boatload. The liquidity was there, everything was there, and they just sold right off. So, yeah. Uh, two questions for you. What's um, up? One, like on collaboration, what do you feel about a trader working by themselves or with some people where, where you're sharing ideas? Yeah. And two, um, how do you go about building brand new ideas as a trader? Because I, I think that markets are always changing. It's always important to have new irons in the fire. Totally. What are you doing? Totally. So, I kind of trade in like a small room with like 15, 20 people that I've kind of known over the years that are kind of similar to me. And the reason why that happened at first is because when I was trading alone, I really, I was only basing my plan on myself. I had no other confirmation than myself. It was only, if I thought it was right, it was probably right. And then I kind of met a guy on the internet, Bao, Modern Rock, um, who kind of, um, we were talking on AIM all the time because we had a similar style. And any time that I wanted to attack something, any time that I wanted to do something, or any time I formed a plan on it, I'd say, hey, what do you think about this? Because he trades similarly to me. And if he didn't agree on it, I would not use size on it because I like, if someone that I'm trading with, as someone that trades the same way as me, doesn't agree with the play that I see, that means that I'm probably not gonna be right there. But if me and him both agree, that that's the play that's gonna work. If we both agree that our plans are the same, that's the, usually the ones that are the home runs. So I think it's really important to kind of surround yourself with people that are trading the same way you are, 
or trading the same things you are. Because if you're a short bias trader, yeah, it's beneficial to have long bias traders that you kind of talk to, but at the end of the day, you're not long bias. You're focusing on making money going short. So again, if you get that confirmation from your trading buddies or you get that confirmation from people that are trading the same way as you, it gives you more confidence to kind of size into that setup. Whereas before, I would just do whatever I thought was right. And now I start to recognize that if three or four guys or, or 10 guys that I'm talking to are all on the same page, nine out of 10 times, that thing is a winner. And about kind of adjusting your strategy and stuff like that, that's why I'm on Twitter all the time, man. That's why I'm always there trying to find like new people trading new things. Like I just found some guy on Twitter today that makes money trading the long side of all the stocks that I've been shorting. So I'm kind of like reaching out to him and saying like, hey, like, like what could I offer to you that you could kind of help me out and kind of teach me this, how to long these turd stocks rather than shorting them? Like what can I do to offer to you? Like what can I offer to you that you would be comfortable to kind of help me out? And he didn't really know what to say. So I said, come join my small room with a bunch of other people. And he's like, yeah, like I'm gonna do it. So today, now he's in our small room and now I'm gonna try to see the little nuances I can pick up from him because the way that I learned how to trade is because I was surrounding myself with traders that were better than me. Traders that were doing things a lot more fluidly than me. And just watching them trade over and over again, watching why they shorted here or why they covered here or what their plan was here, over and over again, just finally start to rub off on me. And that's what I think would help a lot of people as well. <clears throat> Once you achieved consistency and you started working on your sizing, what was just one of the biggest hurdles you faced? And you were talking about how you don't think you could go back down scaling-wise, mm -hmm. but do you do that in times of drawdowns? Yeah. Like, yeah, so during drawdowns, like I said, I take that time off and then I come back. And I'm not just gonna dive in, let's say, my, again, my normal size, let's say 50,000 shares or whatever it's gonna be. I'm not gonna dive in going with that all over again. I need to kind of, get my confidence back. I need to make sure that you know my mentality is right. The reason why I made so much money on my win streak is because I was so confident in my process that I was willing to size up more. I was willing to kind of push myself even more. And now that that win streak is over, I'm gonna go back to what I was doing before, just trading normally. But it's okay to trade low, uh, smaller size when you're on a drawdown. It's okay to kind of take it slow. It's okay to do all this stuff because the reality is like there's always going to be a play tomorrow. There's always going to be a play. Like, there's no sense of feeling like you're going to miss out because this trade is happening today or that trade's happening tomorrow. Like the market's always going to be here forever. Like it's just there's always going to be plays. Like you have Tesla, you have AXON, you have Twitter from the other day. Like there's always going to be things moving. So you should never feel a sense of you're going to miss out on something. Or you should never feel a sense of I have to size up on this even though I'm losing or even though I'm not confident. It all comes back to the fact of being confident in yourself and being confident in your process. Because if you're making money for 10 days straight, I don't care what you say or what you do, you're gonna feel better about your process. You're gonna feel confident in yourself. And trading is an emotional, it's an emotional game. Like no matter what anyone says, you have to be emotionally sharp. You have to be a rock when you're down. You have to be smart. You have to take away that P&L whenever you're winning. You gotta just make sure you do whatever you gotta do to make sure you're head is clear to make sure your brain is clear because like I said if you're having problems at home or if you're having problems with your friends or whatever it is like you shouldn't be trading because like those problems are gonna show in your trades as well you're gonna get impatient you're gonna size in more you're gonna do everything you shouldn't be doing for some of the new traders or trainees is there any literature or any readings or anything that you follow or you would recommend to them? And if you don't know it right now, you think about it, you can post it on your Twitter. Yeah, I could post that, but I really, well, when I first started, something that really helped me is uh, I started recording my screens like every single day. And like, for example, on AXON, let's say I recorded my screen on it. I would slow it down and watch the tape when the stock was either breaking out or breaking down to see what was going on on the tape just to kind of get a better idea for it. Because tape reading is not easy. Like it takes time to kind of figure out how to do it. And tape reading is really important for me. So what I've kind of been focusing on is when I first started was kind of watching how the tape was reacting to the extreme breakouts and breakdowns or kind of 
getting better at technical analysis or getting better at fundamentals, sitting there on a Saturday and reading a 10K and Googling what some of these words meant. And like, it's all about, like it takes time. Like no matter what, it takes time. Like you could read, like I said, a thousand books or watch a hundred videos, but until you dive in and do it yourself, it's not gonna stick to you. Like, it's like uh, riding a bike. If, it's gonna take you to fall off a couple times to start to realize how to actually ride a bike. So again, just sitting there and just reading the 10K, because I like fundamentals. I love learning how much cash a company has. I love learning when was the last offering, when they're gonna raise money again, if they have a deadline of three days on their S3 that they have to raise money, whatever it is. Like, I like it knowing that, because information is power in this industry. The more you know, the more power you have. And like I said, these chart examples, Stocks always conform to the charts. It always, like, it's amazing to me that almost all the time they conform to this technical analysis. So make sure you get better at technicals. Make sure you're getting better at tapering. Slow it down. Learn fundamentals. Spend that Saturday night reading that 10K, whatever it is. And if you don't know what it is, there's a lot of free assets on Twitter or message me, DM me. Like I'm here all day just sitting here and just replying, replying, replying because one, I like, I like helping people. And two, like, it's, it's rewarding to have like, some guy that says, hey, you know, a month ago we were talking, this finally works for me. Or like, I started to get better at tape reading and this finally works for me. It's just get more information than the guy you're trading against is what is gonna help you. And for books and videos, YouTube, YouTube is free. Just learn how to read tape. It's probably a thousand videos. It's just, I don't know, there's so many free resources out there that just spend that weekend and just watch it. There's no other better way to say it. Gotta work hard, it's not easy. Thank you so much for watching our video. If you want to see more of our videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking the button here. We do our best to post a new video every single day. If you have any questions about MIC or any general trading questions, please text Tosh using the number here. Also, stay up to date by watching some of our most recent videos right over here.